Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Mark. And um, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak tonight. Thank you to Dr. O'Donnell. Thank you to um, everyone at the college. Um, but most importantly, um, thank you for the invitation over the past several years uh, to teach at the college. Um, to my mind, you know, teaching a young person, helping to form a young person's uh, intellect, their soul, is that, you know, one of the gravest uh, responsibilities that we have as educators, as intellectuals. And so um, being invited to, you know, uh, partake of that was a great blessing, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, thank you to those uh, in the room who support the college, because I think Christendom College is working miracles. Um, one of the few authentically Catholic colleges left in the United States, and it's doing God's work in forming the next generation. And so thank you for supporting the college. You wouldn't hear me say that about my alma mater in South Bend, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, all right, so what I want to do tonight is um, say a little bit about where we find ourselves right now as a political and cultural uh, reality. Um, so you, you heard learned lectures during the day about history, philosophy, theology. I, I'm the guy that has to talk about politics and law. Um, so they put me after dinner. Uh, the chef has fed you well. You've had chocolate cake, red wine. Uh, so hopefully you can doze off, take a little nap before we move to the terrace for, for after dinner drinks. But um, I'm going to you know, be a little depressing. But where we find ourselves right now is a cultural and legal matter. Uh, and then second, I want to talk about some recent Supreme Court uh, victories on religious liberty, um, but also explain why those victories aren't enough, uh, why, religiously, why religious liberty is important, but it's not sufficient. Okay, if you think about this, necessary but not sufficient, uh, if you remember your philosophy lecture courses. Um, and then third, I want to talk about what the role of government is. You know, from a Catholic perspective, what is the role of the state uh, in promoting and protecting human dignity and human flourishing, and why uh, religious liberty is going to be an essential part of that, but it's not going to be the only part of that. And then lastly, uh, part four, I want to say a few words about what we should do now um, and you know, what the uh, likely vocations are going to be of Christendom uh, graduates, what their life is going to be looking like. And, and as Mark mentioned, I've been very blessed. The way that I first got connected with the college was I had the best intern ever during my time at uh, Heritage, uh, Melody Wood. Uh, I think she was class of 2014, 2015. Um, she was my intern. She then invited me out to campus to give a talk. I then hired her to be my research assistant. She then went to Notre Dame where she's finishing up her dissertation. As she was leaving to you know, being my RA, uh, we were talking about her grad school. She then found me Monica Burke, who was a graduate, I think, of 2016. She came, worked for me for two years. She's now at Catholic University of America doing her PhD. Uh, and these were just you know, wonderful interns, wonderful research assistants. Um, and that was where I said, I want to learn more about this college. If they're producing this type of, of student, they're doing something really remarkable um, because they were much better than my Ivy League interns. And, um, and that says something. Okay, so the depressing part of the talk, where do we find ourselves? Um, for the past several decades, secular progressives have advanced the sexual revolution through aggressive government mandates. Uh, and that shouldn't be an unfamiliar statement, I would hope, uh, because it should be a familiar story. That What we've seen is that a movement that claims merely to want personal freedom, to quote, live and let live, uh, first, it works to get the courts to repeal laws that uh, purportedly limit their freedom. Then they use the government to subsidize their preferred choices. Then they use the government to mandate that other people support their preferred choices. And then finally, they try to use the government to punish anyone who disagrees with them. Right? And so we can walk through examples of this. Judicial activism in the name of personal freedom, overturns abortion laws in all 50 states and creates a so-called right to abortion. The right to abortion then becomes a demand for government-funded abortion. Then it becomes a mandate that the Little Sisters of the Poor pay for abortion. And now it's a movement to punish pharmacists and nurses and doctors if they don't dispense abortion-causing drugs or participate in abortions. On a different topic, judicial uh, um, uh, activism redefines marriage, 
and the baker has to bake the cake or else he's a bigot. And just last week at the Supreme Court, they refused to hear the case of the florist, the evangelical florist, a friend of mine now, Baronel Stutzman, uh, who was the florist for a decade for a same-sex couple doing the happy birthday flowers, the get well soon flowers, when they were going to um, uh, have a ceremony claiming to be married, they asked her to do the wedding flowers. She said, you know I love you guys, but I can't use my God-given gifts and talents to help celebrate something that I don't think lines up with God's plan for marriage. They then sued her. Um, because the Supreme Court has declined to review her case, she's now on the line, not just uh, with the fine that the state government had levied against her, but for all of the lawyer fees for the ACLU. And you know this was hundreds of hours because it dragged on so long. So depending on how vindictive the ACLU decides to be, if they, charge, if they choose to bill her for every last hour at their ridiculous uh, hourly rates, um, she is now in her late 70s and she could lose everything. So again, this is you know, a movement that claims just to want personal freedom, to live and let live, uses the courts to change the law, then uses the government to subsidize it, then uses the government to punish people who don't agree. All right, that's somewhat depressing, it gets worse. Um, <laughs> Now, there have been important Supreme Court victories on religious liberty, right? Hobby Lobby. Um, I met with Steve Green a few weeks ago. His family's business is still in business because of a five to four Supreme Court victory. And that's a meaningful victory. It's important. It matters. Um, we've had a victory just last week um, in uh, the Philadelphia foster care agency case. We've had victories for school choice, for a ministerial exemption. I'll go through a bunch of these specific cases. The Little Sisters of the Poor won three times at the Supreme Court. Um, the fact that it had to be three times tells you that there's something uh, problematic. And so we should celebrate those victories. So before I move on to say why they're not enough, we should pause to recognize that these are real victories because religious freedom is a real authentic human right. Second Vatican Council, Theonatatus Humanae teaches that the civil government does not have the authority to coerce our religious acts because they're transcendent. And it's because of the duty that we owe to the creator that the civil government doesn't have the authority to prevent us from fulfilling our duties to the creator. Um, you, you, we now see some voices in the United States on the left side of the political spectrum saying that religious liberty is not a real human right that if religious liberty conflicts with the right to abortion or the right to gay marriage or the right for a man to become a woman, religious liberty has to lose. They're wrong because none of those purported rights, you know, to kill an unborn baby, to redefine marriage, to uh, change your uh, gender identity, those aren't real human rights and religious liberty is. Right? And so this is gonna be important uh, that we defend religious liberty against the voices on the left who are giving up on it. There are also some voices on the right who are giving up on religious liberty, um, saying religious liberty is only if you practice the true faith, uh, that religious liberty is not for Protestants or it's not for non-Christians, et cetera, et cetera. That's also a mistake, um, that Dignitatis Humanae understood that there were non-Christian world religions, and it was saying even those people, uh, they have a right from civil government coercion. That doesn't mean that their religion is fully true. It doesn't mean that it's fully good. It means that the secular authority is limited and can't coerce their religious actions. So faithful Catholics, uh, like people associated with Christendom, should be defending religious liberty be precisely because it protects the space, the freedom for us to discern the truth about God and then to fulfill our duties to God. And that those are questions that we need to discern and find out for ourselves. But it's not enough, uh, because our vocation as faithful citizens isn't just to exempt ourselves from unjust laws, but it's to see that just laws are enacted in the first place. Um, so I want to suggest a couple of reasons why it's not enough. First, religious liberty doesn't protect people who aren't religious, but hold morally true convictions. If you are secular and you believe we shouldn't be killing unborn babies, a law that forces you to do what the Green family had to do and what uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor have to do is an unjust law. Right? So they're non-religious people who share our moral beliefs. Their uh, liberty should be protected. Second, there are other goods at stake besides religion. Um, so if you have a bad healthcare law 
That's bad for healthcare. It's not just bad for religious people vis-a-vis -vis healthcare. Uh, if you have a bad education law, that's bad for all students, not just the religious students. Right? So there are other goods at stake besides religion. And then the third reason that I would suggest is that um, we also want to be contesting about the truth of the matter. What's the truth about unborn human life? What's the truth about marriage? What's the truth about our embodiment as male or female? And religious liberty doesn't address that. So what I want to suggest is that we need a more holistic response um, to the political, legal, and cultural struggles that we uh, are experiencing. Um, that some people who are tempted to say, let's just put all of our eggs in the religious liberty basket are being too short-sighted. Um, that we can't give up on the public discussion, the public debate, the legal debate on the merits, on the underlying truth claims. And this is particularly, particularly true uh, when it comes to uh, gender identity, transgender claims, um, to the bad Supreme Court ruling last year from Justice Gorsuch, I mean, which is rather surprising to many of us, where he said the word sex now means gender identity. Um, to my own uh, um, uh, personal um, experience with Amazon, you know, for three years while President Donald Trump was in the White House, while Bill Barr was the Attorney General, while Josh Hawley was in the majority and therefore had committee power in the Senate, Amazon sold the book. And then as soon as all those people were out of office, as soon as Nancy Pelosi was about to bring a transgender bill to the House floor, Amazon disappeared the book. Right? And the reason why is that the book's threatening to them. Um, the books that I've written about gay marriage, about uh, religious liberty, they think that they've won those debates, and so my books are powerless. They still think that the transgender debate is up for grabs. And so a book uh, um, like that could persuade people, and therefore it threatens them. OK, so that was part one, the depressing part. Um, although, <laughs> to a certain extent, all four parts are a little depressing. Um, but that was the most depressing part. Um, second, let me say a little bit about the Supreme Court. Um, some victories, so this will be somewhat more optimistic, um, but I'm going to say some good religious liberty victories, in, in particular for some Catholic uh, plaintiffs, some Catholic uh, clients uh, won these Supreme Court victories. The, the law firms representing them, Alliance Defending Freedom and Beckett, uh, two great uh, uh, public interest nonprofit law firms representing people pro bono uh, so that they can um, uh, have their day in court. Uh, but let me mention four recent this term and the previous term victories. Uh, first, the court in the Espinoza case. It struck down notoriously anti-Catholic Blaine amendments. Uh, these were the amendments that were passed by the know-nothings um, during the wave of Catholic immigrants. They wanted to make sure uh, that Catholics wouldn't be eligible for any public funding. Uh, and so many states passed state Blaine amendments. The federal Blaine amendment was never uh, ratified. And the court struck these uh, amendments down as applied to funding for education. Um, but if you read the opinion, the logic of the opinion suggests that it would apply to all public funding. Um, and this is great, because what the, what the court ruled, it says, look, the Constitution doesn't require funding for private schools, but if your state chooses to enact a voucher program, you can't refuse to allow parents to use those vouchers at faith-based schools, including Catholic schools. Um, and so that's an important religious liberty win because if you are a working class Catholic family and your only option is sending your kids to the government run public schools, you would now have an option if your state does create a school choice program uh, to use that voucher to send your kids to the Catholic school, um, which for many families is going to be a life saving, soul saving option because the public schools are getting, I, I could never, we live in Loudoun County, we live north of Leesburg and Luckett's. That's like been the center of all of the critical race theory, all of the trans, we could never send our kids there, right? And so we're paying ridiculous property taxes and we're gonna have to save our money to send our kids to a Catholic school or to homeschool our kids. So this is an important win. All right, second was the Little Sisters case, the third Little Sisters case. Um, this was two years ago. If you don't remember this, the state of California and the state of Pennsylvania had sued the Trump administration saying you can't protect the Little Sisters. We want the Obamacare mandate enforced. And so then the Little Sisters had to intervene to defend the protection that they had been granted from the Trump administration. And so they, they went back and they won. And so that's important because at the very least, 
the federal government should be allowed to protect religious liberty when a prior administration of the federal government has violated religious liberty. And it's ridiculous that the state AGs thought that they could uh, um, have the Supreme Court impose a mandate that the Supreme Court had twice previously struck down. Right? It just shows you how extreme. And you know who this, the AG of California uh, was at the time? He's now our secretary of HHS. Yes, Becerra. He's now the man in charge of our Department of Health and Human Service. That's, that was his reward from the Biden people. Okay, on the very same day that the Supreme Court uh, protected the Little Sisters of the Poor, the court also ruled in a case known as Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a uh, Catholic institution. Um, not many evangelicals uh, named their schools Our Lady of Guadalupe. So this was a, a Catholic school, and it involved um, a, a staffing decision. Who gets to teach at a Catholic school? And the teacher has sued the school trying to be reinstated and saying that uh, secular um, uh, uh, government employment laws apply to staffing decisions for sacred institutions. And the court said no, uh, that the ministerial exemption, uh, it's a doctrine under the First Amendment, says that religious institutions have the freedom to decide who is gonna function in a ministerial capacity. And by ministerial capacity, we don't just mean priests, pastors, and rabbis. We mean anyone who functions ministerially with respect to a student. And so this case, it was a grade school teacher. And the argument here is that if you're sending your kids to a Catholic grade school, it's not just the priest or the, you know, the nun who is ministering to your students, the kindergartner teacher, the first grade teacher, the second, they're functioning in a ministerial capacity because they're teaching your children about the faith and they're embodying what it looks like to live out the faith. Uh, and so this, I forget the exact details of this case, but you could imagine various Catholic school teachers who openly dissent, who openly live lives that aren't in accordance with Catholic teaching and Catholic institutions need to have the ability to meaningfully staff themselves, to hire teachers, professors who are meaningfully Catholic and not just check the box. Right? Would any of you send your kids to a school where Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden were the teachers? Right? No, you could just send them to public schools in that case. Right? The reason parents sacrifice to send their kids to Catholic school so it can be meaningfully Catholic. Right? So this is an important win. All right, and then this term, uh, just uh, I guess two or three weeks ago now, the Fulton case. Uh, Sharon L. Fulton was a foster mother, Catholic foster mother in Philadelphia. And then the city said, you can no longer work with Catholic social services because we are shutting them down. We are, um, the, the technicality here is that they said, we're just not renewing their contract. But if you don't have a government contract, you can't actually take care of foster kids because foster kids are wards of the state. The state has a monopoly um, of foster uh, children. And so if they deny you a contract, you can't care for them. Um, so thank God Archbishop Chaput um, is not a coward. He did not cave, he sued. And the foster mother sued. Uh, he did not just say, all right, well, if the government says no, we'll just shut, shut down. He fought this, uh, just like St. Paul did. Right? St. Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen, and I'm going to use the law to protect my rights when St. Paul was being persecuted. Chip Hugh said the same thing. Um, it's a unanimous decision, but the holding is somewhat narrow. And, and what I mean by that is we got a 9 nothing win um, when the leading arguments coming from the left is that if you're against same-sex marriage, you're just like the bigots who are against interracial marriage. And so we shouldn't discount the importance of a unanimous victory. Racists did not get many, any, nine nothing Supreme Court victories. In fact, Bob Jones University lost their religious liberty claim. Right? So it's important to see that there was a unanimous ruling here, but the, the holding was more narrow than I think many people would have liked. And if you read the dissenting opinion that um, Justice Alito wrote and that Justice Thomas and um, Justice Gorsuch signed on to, they said, look, we should have just overturned the employment um, division v. Smith case. Uh, and said that the Constitution requires uh, that Catholic social services be protected. The reason why Catholic social services won in this case was that the city of Philadelphia said that we would grant certain exemptions for certain reasons, but not for religious reasons. And so the court said, that's a double standard that you can't have, and that's what got them into strict scrutiny. Okay, all important wins. Why aren't they enough? 
First, as important, take, take the um, uh, first case that I mentioned, the Espinoza case, the school choice case, struck down Blaine amendments. As important as ensuring equal access to government funding is, and, and I say this realizing that this school does not take government funding, um, it's not enough because the vast majority of states still don't have any school choice programs. Right? You could live in a jurisdiction where if you are a uh, working class, middle class family, you can't afford to send your kids to a Catholic school. And so your only option is public schools. And so we as faithful citizens need to be engaged in what's being taught at the government run uh, school. I, I don't like calling them public schools because it implies that Catholic schools somehow aren't public. Right? Catholic schools educate the public just as much as government run schools educate the public. The difference is that the government run schools get your tax dollars and the Catholic schools don't. Right? Um, but we should care about whether or not the public schools, the government run schools, are indoctrinating students with the gender unicorn, whether or not they're allowing boys to compete on the girls' sports teams, uh, whether or not they're engaging in you know, indoctrination with critical race theory so that people you know, learn to hate the country that has given them so many blessings. We need to be engaged in all of those debates. We can't just say, well, at least we can opt out. Right? At least we have you know, a voucher program or education savings account, or we're just you know, personally financially well off and we can pay full freight at the local prep school. Right? We need to be engaged uh, in these questions. Second, the, the Little Sisters of the Poor case. Look, it's great that three times they went to the Supreme Court and three times they won, but the process is part of the punishment. And what we have seen, uh, thankfully not um, with too many Catholic institutions, but Bethany Christian Services uh, has caved on the same-sex adoption question. Uh, there were two foster care agencies in Philadelphia that wouldn't do same-sex adoption, and now there's only one. It's the Catholic service. Bethany, Christians, uh, Beth Bethany Christian Services has announced that they're going to do same-sex adoptions, right? Because they didn't want to be punished by the process of litigating, right? And realize that um, Jack Phillips, who won his Supreme Court case, if you talk to him, he'll tell you it was like going through hell. It's a, not a pleasurable, fun experience. He wanted to be a baker. He wanted to be you know, crafting these, it was called Masterpiece Cake Shop because he was creating masterpieces of art, but his canvas was flour and his paint was sugar. Right? He didn't want to be a plaintiff at the Supreme Court. So even if you win, you're still going through a process which is punishment, but then second, the Obamacare contraception mandate still exists. And it's an unjust mandate. Even if we have exemptions for the owners of Hobby Lobby and for the Little Sisters of the Poor, it's an unjust law that our government mandates businesses of a certain size pay for contraception and abortion-causing pills. And it's particularly unjust that they do this as a preventative health care mandate. Right? Contraception and abortion don't prevent a disease. If you're reproducing, your reproductive system is working well, right? And so this is an unjust law regardless of whether you're Catholic or not. It's also, it violates a pro-life principle, right? That's why the Green family, the, the owners of Hobby Lobby objected. They're not the little sisters of the poor, they're not Catholic, they don't object to contraception, but they do object to the four um, uh, drugs and devices that were mandated by HHS that had FDA labels saying that they could kill a developing embryo. That mandate still exists. And with Javier Becerra uh, as the secretary of HHS, and with Dr. Levine being uh, the, the assistant secretary, I have no doubt that the, um, the religious liberty exemptions that my colleague at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Roger Severino, Roger, uh, for four years, was the head of civil rights at HHS. And he undid as many of the bad mandates that came from the Obama people you know, he came to work uh, with me at EPPC, and we're now watching as the Biden people undo all the good things that Roger did, right? Because the underlying law exists, and now that we have a bad administration, they can put back all of the bad uh, provisions. Okay, uh, third, uh, I'm gonna skip to do, do the adoption agency case first, and then I'm gonna go back to um, uh, the, 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 the teaching uh, case. It's great that Philadelphia Catholic Social Services um, won their case. But as Alito's concurrence pointed out, um, so it's a nine nothing, he concurs, but he concurs in the judgment in order to dissent from the holding more or less. I mean, that's when you read it, you see what he's doing. He's saying, look, 
the mayor of Philadelphia can come back tomorrow and say, all right, fine, we're just getting rid of all exemptions, both secular exemptions and religious exemptions, and then Catholic Social Services is right back in court. Right? Uh, and even if uh, we do protect the ability of Catholic adoption agencies and foster care agencies to stay in business, all of the rest of the agencies are refusing to protect a child's right to have a mother and a father. Right? Religious liberty isn't the only issue at stake here. It's like, do we still believe and are we still willing to defend the proposition that children deserve both a mother and a father? Right? And one of the downsides about Obergefell is increasingly few and few people are willing to suggest that that's a truth. And when I quote, a child has a right to a mother and a father, I'm quoting Pope Francis. Right? That's not you know, some crazy uh, right-wing nut job. Right? That, that's our current pope. And yet increasingly, you find that fewer and fewer um, Americans are willing to affirm that. And then uh, the fourth case that I had mentioned, the ministerial exemption case. This is good. It will protect the ability of a school like Christendom to staff meaningfully with Catholic faculty, with Catholic professors, with Catholic coaches, with Catholic student life uh, people, anyone who's functioning in a ministerial capacity, this is a great precedent to protect you. But there are lots of people uh, who don't function in ministerial capacities, uh, and there are lots of employment decisions um, that you couldn't even make a religious liberty case. So, for example, if the Green family, the owners of Hobby Lobby, refuse to pay for sex reassignment procedures as part of their health care plan, will they have to be back in court? And I think the answer here is yes, um, that we're waiting uh, to see when we'll have an employment decision uh, related to um, gender affirmation, as they now call it, procedures. We saw that the owner of the funeral home, uh, this was an evangelical business owner, for six years he had a male employee who was the funeral home director. Um, he received a letter from the employee saying, I'm taking a two-week vacation and then I'm coming back as a woman. And the owner said, "I." can't allow you to do that because like, we're dealing with grieving families and it's gonna be obvious that you're a male wearing a dress and this isn't going to work in two weeks vacation. And he was sued by the employee and he lost. Uh, the Bostock case was also paired with the Harris Funeral Home case. That dealt with the direct employment question, employment or termination. There's then gonna be the next case about benefits whether or not as a condition of employment or a benefit of employment, you have to allow your employees to use uh, the bathroom or the locker room of their choice, whether or not your health care plan, if it covers a mastectomy for a female employee with breast cancer, does it have to cover a mastectomy for a female employee who wants to identify as a male? Right? These are the future employment cases that are coming. And the ministerial exemption, while it's important, it's not going to be enough because it's not going to cover any of those cases. And the holding in the Bostock case isn't going to be limited to employment. We've already seen, just within the past three weeks, uh, the Biden administration has said that the logic of the Bostock case, which said the word sex means gender identity in employment law, also applies to every other area of federal civil rights law that has the word sex, most particularly education law, Title IX. And again, Christendom is lucky. Title IX doesn't apply to you guys because you don't take government funding. It's an important hedge that you've placed to protect yourself. But most other institutions, both uh, religious and non-religious, do take government funding. And therefore, Title IX applies. And the Biden people are saying the word sex now means gender identity. And that applies not just, um, this is going to apply not just to uh, uh, colleges and universities, but through K through 12. And so privacy and safety in a bathroom, in a homeless shelter, matters whether you're religious or not. Equality and safety on an athletic field matters whether you're religious or not. It's not just the Catholic athletes, the Catholic girls who don't like losing to boys who identify as girls. Right? This isn't a religious liberty issue. And then lastly, good medicine is at stake. There are two 13-year-old girls uh, who your tax dollars paid to have double mastectomies performed as part of their uh, transition care. Two 13-year-olds, right? NIH-funded research in the state of California. I don't care if those girls were religious or not. That was bad medicine, and that was an abuse of their bodies. And so as important as religious liberty is, as faithful Catholics who want to be good citizens, 
we need to be engaged on all of these other cultural, political, and legal conversations as well. All right, so why, part three? Uh, because the role of the government isn't just to exempt Catholics from bad laws, the role of the government is to pass good laws in the first place. Right? I mean, that's the simplest way um, to phrase it. What, what we want here is not um, a culture, and a legal culture in particular, um, that is just rife full of bad laws, but we keep getting exemptions. We want to see a political community that fosters authentic liberty, authentic human flourishing. Um, this is where you can see that this isn't just um, a Catholic thing, uh, although it is, but Martin Luther King Jr. I like citing um, MLK's letter from the Birmingham jail because it suggests sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, you know, natural law theory, it's just something for like white men, it's just something for Catholics. It was a crucial argument in the most important uh, movement in our country, the civil rights movement. And if you think about what Martin Luther King Jr. did, he cites both Augustine and Aquinas to say that an unjust law is no law at all. And how do we know if a law is unjust? Because it's a man-made law that doesn't square with the natural law and the eternal law. Right? And so here you can see in one of the most important social reform movements of our country's history, what MLK did was he said, look, we're not honoring the Declaration of Independence, that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that man-made law is not squaring with natural law, with eternal law. Um, that what we're seeking here is not just islands of exemptions, but the state to promote laws that are actually just. And so what happens when man-made law violates the natural law? Um, there are consequences. Um, so I've, um, I've, in other pieces of writing, I've said that there are human costs to getting human nature wrong. And I think the clearest way you can see this is with the sexual revolution. Uh, it started as a cultural phenomenon with the 60s, 1968 in particular, but then a legal phenomenon uh, with Roe v. Wade, uh, with various forms of um, uh, uh, sexual kind of laws, the overturning of laws in something like um, Lawrence v. Texas with the redefinition of marriage with Windsor and Obergefell and then Bostock. What have we seen? We've seen millions of unborn babies killed We've seen millions of children growing up without their fathers. We've seen millions, millions of women being used and abused, and now millions of men addicted to pornography. Right? This has been an utter disaster, right? because when you have man-made law getting the natural law and the eternal law wrong, there are human costs to getting human nature wrong. And now, as if you know, abortion and the various harms to children, to women, and to men of the sexual revolution aren't bad enough. We now have a situation where if you're a child who doesn't feel comfortable in your own body, you might be prescribed puberty-blocking drugs, cross-sex hormones, and then have surgery to permanently mutilate your body. Uh, there's a 4,400% increase in the number of teenage and 20-something uh, girls and women who are going to gender clinics seeking testosterone. This is astounding. These aren't religious liberty issues. Right? There are other goods that are at stake, the right to life, right? the right to grow up with a mother and a father, right? bodily integrity, and the, the dignity of the body as male and female, and it's, so other goods at stake. And it's not just for religious people. Right? Non-religious babies should not be being aborted. Non-religious kids should be growing up with mothers and fathers. Non-religious kids shouldn't be having double mastectomies performed at age 13. And then lastly, the truth of the matter is at stake. There is a truth about that child developing in the womb. There is a truth about what marriage is. There's a truth about our reality and therefore our identity being made in the image and likeness of God as male or female. And the law is getting all of those things wrong right now, which is also how we then get the religious liberty violations. Right? So even if all you cared about was religious liberty, you should still want to see man-made law reflect the natural law because it's only when we passed unjust laws to begin with that true religious beliefs could be violated. Right? There'll never be a conflict between true religion and just laws because the natural law and the divine law both descend from the eternal law. 
So there's a double reason to care about just laws, right? For, for their own sake in promoting the common good and promoting human flourishing and promoting and protecting human dignity, but also as a way of avoiding religious liberty violations. If we didn't have Roe v. Wade, if we didn't have Obergefell, if we didn't have several states that have allowed physician-assisted suicide, if we didn't have the various transgender mandates, we wouldn't have religious liberty cases on any of those issues. Right? No vote Roe v. Wade, there's no law trying to force the owners of Hobby Lobby to pay for abortion. No Obergefell, there's no city of Philadelphia trying to shut down the Catholic adoption agency. Right? So it's only when we get the law wrong in the first place that we then have the religious liberty violations. Okay, um, final part of the talk, what to do now. Um, I mean, I think the short answer here is that what we need to do is in every area of uh, law, culture, policy, family life, every area of society, we need to be bearing witness to the truth. Uh, and so there's gonna be as many different vocations to do this, different ways of doing this, as there are people in this room, as there are students at this college, as there are you know, baptized, believing, practicing uh, Catholics. But before I say some concrete things there, I wanna give you a way of thinking about this because I think we have learned the right lesson in the pro-life movement. After Roe v. Wade, the response wasn't, let's just protect religious liberty. Right? The pro-life movement could have said, oh wait, court got Roe v. Wade long, let's just make sure that Catholic hospitals and Catholic doctors don't have to perform abortion. And they said, no, we're gonna do that and more. Right? It was important to protect religious liberty, it was important to have things like the Hyde Amendment and the Church Amendment, which protected taxpayer dollars from going to abortion, that protected uh, um, faith-based and other pro-life doctors and hospitals from having to perform abortions, but that wasn't enough. And the demand from the pro-life movement has always been that every life would be protected in law. Not just Catholic babies, not just Catholic doctors, but every life protected in law. And so um, you can think of it this way. Would you say to yourself, it's okay to kill unborn babies so long as there's a religious liberty exemption for Catholic babies? And the answer is no. Right? You wouldn't even be tempted to say that. So likewise, you wouldn't say, you know, it's okay to kill born babies so long as Catholics don't have to do the killing. You wouldn't say that either, because what you're gonna say, and I think most um, American Catholics see this, is that no one should be killing unborn babies. So the same thing would be true on the transgender questions. Is it okay to mutilate the bodies of children so long as there's a religious liberty exemption for Catholic children? Or it's okay to mutilate the bodies of children so long as there's a religious liberty exemption for Catholic doctors? It's okay to have boys competing against girls in sports so long as there's a religious liberty exemption for Catholic girls. Right? And you see that the answer for all of these is going to be no. That while religious liberty is important, it shouldn't be our only or even our primary public argument. Uh, the, 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 the truths that we should be witnessing to are truths uh, for everyone. So it strikes me that there are gonna be at least um, uh, four areas in particular that have, of heightened importance. Uh, one is that elections have consequences. Um, who is controlling power, whether it be in Washington, D.C., or in Richmond, Virginia, or wherever your state capital may be, has consequences. Because what the law, what the government says on these issues will have impacts not just for our religious liberty, but for all of our other freedoms and for the way that our children will be educated, for the way that medicine will be practiced, for the way that um, various programs will be conducted. Uh, so elections matter. Um, but elections aren't enough. So second area, legislation, litigation, and regulation all matters. You know, just because the right person is in the White House doesn't mean that the right regulation is gonna come out of the Department of Education or the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, the agencies during the Trump administration that were best on these issues were agencies that were staffed with daily mass attending Catholics. I mean, that's just the reality. Uh, that personnel is policy and having the right people in those offices made a huge difference. Litigation is going to matter. It's gonna be important not just that ADF and Beckett litigate religious liberty cases, but that we also litigate athletic competition cases and that we litigate um, medical cases. Uh, Kiara Bell should be a household name. Just before Christmas of this past year, uh, she successfully sued the national health system in the United Kingdom and won. 
Uh, when she was 17 years old, she started taking testosterone. At 18, she had a double mastectomy, and at age 22, she regretted it. And she sued, saying that she was too young uh, for the medical doctors to be doing this to her. Uh, and so she got the courts in the UK to say that uh, for any child, any minor, before either puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones or surgery could take place, it needs to be reviewed on an individual basis by the court system. We have nothing like that in the US. Right? So we need, and that's not a religious liberty case. Right? As far as I know, she's not a religious uh, individual, or at least not religiously practicing. I think everyone's a religious individual, but not all of us uh, practice. And actually, we all kind of do practice religions. We just don't all practice orthodox religions. Um, and then there needs to be legislation, right? I mean, what's happening uh, at state houses, what's happening on Capitol Hill makes a difference. Um, what happens makes a difference here. And then the last two areas, I'm gonna um, lump them together. There need to be culture-forming institutions. Um, Hollywood matters. The mass media matters. Um, public intellectuals matter, right? It's important that there are people who can speak in the public square on these issues. The other side has an endless list of experts and of Hollywood stars and of various you know, speakers who charge you know, ridiculous $50,000 speaking fees to tell you why you're a racist, right? Our side needs to have people who can engage in all of that, you know, producing movies, producing TV shows, music. Did you see just recently, maybe three weeks ago, the banjo player Mumford & Sons, you know, he resigned because he had tweeted support uh, uh, for someone who is you know, politically incorrect, right? We need people like that, people in the arts, people in the culture-forming institutions, willing to sacrifice uh, for the sake of the truth. And then we also need personal witnesses. Uh, and by personal witness, I, I mean like just living it out in your own possibly so-called private life. You know, just being a good neighbor, being a good a member of the PTA, showing up for Little League practice and talking to other parents about what's going on, living it out uh, in your own life. Um, that to a certain extent, um, you know, Benedict the 16th, I like to quote this. He's a world-class uh, theologian, world-class intellectual. And there's a quote of his that I like where he says, it's not the arguments of the theologians that win converts. It's the beauty of the artists and it's the holiness of the saints. Right? And it's all the more powerful coming from Benedict because he is a world-class. Like, it's one thing for like, stupid people to say, yeah, arguments never change minds. It's another thing for a really smart guy to say that. Right? And he's saying, look, as important as all, you know, he's written like 50 books, you know, hundreds of academic articles. As important as all those things are, what really makes the difference is the beauty of holiness. Right? And so I'll wrap up, and then we'll have time uh, for Q&A, unless, unless Mark comes up here with a giant hook, in which case we might not have time for Q&A. Um, but what I'll wrap up by saying, what I like about, what I particularly like about Christendom is that if you uh, think about those four areas that I've discussed, like your graduates are doing all of those things, right? They're learning all of the book smarts, they're getting well-educated, and then they're doing something with it. You know, they're, they're working in the administration, they're working as staffers on Capitol Hill at think tanks, they're forming their own families, they're living this stuff out in their daily life. Uh, and those are the long-term differences, right? I mean, this isn't gonna be the type of thing that the next election solves or the next court case solves. This is a generational uh, battle. Uh, John Paul II, when he was at the Second Vatican Council, said the crisis of the 20th century was a crisis of faulty humanism, right? He then develops this thesis with his Theology of the Body Wednesday audiences. He develops it um, in his various early encyclicals. And you know, the analysis that he gave was that the two world wars, the totalitarian regimes, the killing fields, the Holocaust, the gulag, et cetera, et cetera. It's all from a bad anthropology in which we thought that by eclipsing God, we would be elevating man. When in reality, by getting rid of God, we debased man. Uh, he then extended that analysis in um, Evangelium Vitae to uh, the right to life, uh, and if he were still on the earth with us today, he would extend it further to the redefinition of marriage and now the very redefinition of sex and gender. Uh, and what, where are all of those uh, issues taking place? It's three truths from the very first page of the Bible that were made in the image and likeness of God, that were created male and female, and that male and female are created for each other. Um, whether it's the abortion debate made in the image and likeness of God, uh, the transgender debate created male and female, or the gay marriage debate, male and female created for each other. Those are the truths that are most um, uh, uh, threatened today. 
and Christendom students are living out those truths. Right? They're forming families, they're having babies, they're serving the government, they're coming back you know, as faculty members, et cetera, et cetera. They're doing the work that's bearing witness to the truth in their personal life, their professional life, and in their intellectual and spiritual life. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you uh, for supporting the college.